Hello, good morning. Hi everyone, welcome to the first full day of the Aspen Ideas Festival, Fest One. My name is Jamie Miller. Um, I'm a vice president for public programs at the Aspen Institute, so I'm lucky to get to work on the Ideas Festival and um, lots of other convenings that we do. Um, I'm delighted to introduce um, our moderator for this morning, who's Jonathan Capehart, um, one of our um, good friends of the Ideas Festival um, who never fails to delight and inform. We're so pleased to have him and, and grateful for everything he does for us. He's an opinion writer and on the editorial board at the Washington Post. Um, and so thank you, Jonathan, for being here. And he's going to introduce um, Roz Brewer, who we're so grateful made it to the Aspen Ideas Festival. She is a quite busy lady. And um, we're really, really pleased to have you here. So welcome, both of you. So good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for, for being here for this morning session. Roz, thank you for, for sitting down and having this conversation uh, about all sorts of things, leadership, race, the company, um, the incident that we're all focused on, and that's the focus of, the, of this conversation, yes. is what happened in April of 2018 in Philadelphia at a, at a Starbucks off of uh, Rittenhouse Square. Yes. What, you had just been named COO of Starbucks, what, four months earlier? Correct, I did. Uh, but you weren't, you weren't new to Starbucks. No, no I wasn't. So um, first of all, Jonathan, thank you for uh, joining me in this conversation and uh, the chance to be here. And so no, I uh, was not new to Starbucks. I jo had joined Starbucks as a member of the board of directors. And I joined the member uh, as a member of the board in March, and then I came into the company as um, one of the members of management in October of uh, 2017. Uh, uh, and then uh, the incident happened in April. Mm -hmm. And given your, your tenure on the board, so you're no stranger to the company, you're no stranger, yeah. no stranger to, to the culture. When you got word of what happened in, in Philadelphia, how did, it, how did it hit you? Did it surprise you? Did it not surprise you? Did it concern you? Mm -hmm. So uh, it was uh, quite a few emotions. Uh, first of all, um, I was traveling um, out that day. I was on my way to San Francisco. And because I operate the stores, um, part of operations for the stores in the US, um, usually I'll get an alert if something's going on. So I saw an alert um, that we had an incident in a store, and, and, and I get those alerts. But this one sort of pinged me because it, it, um, it mentioned two men in the store. So I began to you know, kind of figure out what's going on. Lo and behold, um, I learned that it was two African-American men. And so my um, antenna went up immediately. And as the story grew and we learned more, um, two things were happening. One, the incident was being lived out on social media. Mm -hmm. um, and secondly, um, it was happening at the store of Spruce and 18th um, in Philadelphia, an area that I'm very familiar with. And when I learned about the two gentlemen, the thing that struck me most was these were two African-American males, 23 years old at the time, and I have a 23-year-old, my son was 23-year-old um, at, at, at that time at the same time. And the first thing that happened was that my, I really felt like my heart stopped beating because I knew at that time um, this was something deeply personal to me as a mom. But then actually my other hat turned on too and said as a leader in the company, I felt like this happened on my watch. And even though I was new to the company, it was deeply, I immediately felt like it was my responsibility and um, something had to be done. Um, it, one thing that you immediately did, in, in, in addition to feeling immediately responsibility, and correct me if I'm wrong, because you know, I read this in the press. Um, 
<laughs> okay, let's see if we need to demystify this. I mean, we're this. not perfect, <laughs> right. um, but you immediately got on a plane. I sure and did. went to Philadelphia. I sure did. I turned around um, and uh, flew um, all the way back from San Francisco into Philadelphia. Got there late um, in the evening, um, had very few clothes with me, and went uh, right to, um, uh, began to get the team in from Seattle, uh, joined me in Philadelphia, and we created a war room and started working through the, through the night. Okay, great, because I was about to ask you, because we've been talking about your personal uh, reaction and what mm -hmm. you did, but inside the company, take us inside. Um, so you set up a war room, and sure. was it an all hands on deck from the top from the top down? I know uh, Howard Schultz, who at the time was the chairman. He was executive chairman of the board. Executive chairman of the board, and I interviewed him uh, for a column that I did, and I knew. Um, how personal this would be for him. Absolutely. So talk, bring us inside the room. Sure, so inside the room. So because this happened on a Thursday afternoon, right at around three or four o'clock in the evening, um, within that first 24 hours, all of us were in different places. I was actually heading to San Francisco. I had two young black males that I mentor out there, so I was meeting with them. And then uh, Kevin Johnson, the CEO, was heading to another area in California. So we were dispersed in different areas. So we were coming from all parts of the country and landed in, in uh, San Francisco. And uh, Howard, at that time, um, as executive chairman, wasn't involved in the day-to-day. -day. But we brought our executive comms team in, our public affairs team, and uh, we created the war room there in Philadelphia. But then back in Seattle, you've got um, you know, teams of people who are like, what's going on? Because here's what we learned is that this was playing out in social media. And for Starbucks, we have great communications plans, but we are, we, at that point, we weren't on social media. We weren't living our brand out on social media. Oh, so the story surprising. was take, yes, so the story was taking off in social fronts and we couldn't get control of it. Because we're typically, our typical MO is probably to go media first, right? Traditional television media first. And, um, but here's a story and it's living its way out and it's living its way out in the African American social media front. And so um, this is where it's important for us to remember who's your audience and um, what is the message and how do you get your message out there? So the story is being, um, there was a woman who was in the store when the incident happened who filmed the incident. Mm -hmm. And so everything immediately went to social media and then rest of world showed up on the, in the discussion. So what was happening in that room was we were very clear about who's going to do what. And Kevin Johnson, our CEO said, I absolutely need to own this, I need to own this. And so immediately he took the, the face of everything from you know, talking to Good Morning America, the big news media. Um, I actually have had you know, a lot of um, local uh, relationships in Philadelphia. So I took Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. um, I took the partner piece. Um, I dealt with immediately with the store manager that was involved. And to be clear, when you say the, the partner piece, you're, you, you called the stores, you, yes. the, the managers of the stores partners. So our employees are called partners, mm -hmm. um, have always been called partners. And so um, immediately I'm concerned about the partners and how they're feeling about this, right? Because their brand that we all knew and loved was being possibly tainted by this situation. And so everyone was up in arms. And so we had our home office in Seattle. We had field partners in all other stores um, watching this play out and see the two gentlemen being arrested. And then being on the ground in Philadelphia and having the relationships there, I also um, realized that you know there's the local police force that's involved. And so the way the situation happened in the stores is that the two gentlemen entered our store and they were having a meeting, a business meeting, um, with a potential partner, business partner is what I understand. And um, when they came into the store, the, the store manager said, Ken, you know, would you like to buy a beverage? They went to use the restroom. And then um, shortly after they didn't want a beverage, they were just waiting for their friend, and they said, I'm, I'm not gonna buy a beverage, and they sat there. And then our store manager um, told them if they weren't gonna buy a, a beverage, they needed to, to leave the store. Um, and typically, we have, policies around handling situations in the store when people are lingering for a long period of time and not buying beverages. But let's be clear, you know, everyone knows, I mean, I'm sure everybody in here has been in a Starbucks store. 
Well, we have a very welcoming environment, mm -hmm. and we want people to come have a great beverage, sit for a while, and chat. But we also know that society is coming inside our stores as well. And typically, if we have someone who's lingering, who um, might be, um, you know, might be part of our homeless community, is that usually there might be an officer that will circle around, and as soon as that officer hits the door, the individuals will leave. Well, in this situation, our store manager called uh, the police, and the two policemen came, and then they called for backup. Three policemen came, and then more backup came. So within a very short period of time, there were eight officers in the store and two gentlemen. And by that time, their business partner had joined them, and he didn't understand what was going on. He was like, what's going on? And then there's a woman who's filming. And so that's what's happening in the store. And so the incident really began to play out um, mm -hmm. in that way. <clears throat> and so with all of these different forces going on and understanding that, you know, Starbucks has been a, you know, it's, it's a welcoming environment. We hire our partners um, with the affinity to help and serve. And so I knew immediately from, you know, lessons in leadership will tell you, there's a breakdown here. There's a breakdown in leadership. There's a breakdown in our policies. Our policies had not been touched in over 10 years. And as we all know, what happens in communities, it will force you to look, need, need you to relook at your policies, right? Because things are changing. Mm -hmm. The world is changing. Those who want to sit in your store may not be your customers. So how do you handle that? And our policies didn't represent that. Uh, and the names of the, of the two men, because I feel it's important to, it to say their names, Rashawn Nelson and Dante Robinson were the two men who were arrested. You said they were 23 years old, your yes. son's 23 years old. And I'm going to come back, <clears throat> excuse me, come back to that uh, in a little bit. But let's talk about, so you set up this war room. Um, there's an all hands on deck um, mentality. And then it's announced that all of the stores around the country we're going to be closed on the Monday of? Uh, right after. Right after Memorial, Memorial Day, Day. So May the, 29th. Right. Mm -hmm. um, to do sort of in-store training. That's correct. Who's, whose idea was that? And um, where, where did it come from? So we were, once we realized that we had a breakdown in leadership and mm. we knew that our policies weren't in place, we knew we had a lot of work to do. And we knew that in order to maintain the third place in our store as a place where you can come to think, read, and have a great co conversation and coffee, we knew that all of that was at risk. And so we began to think, what is the one game changer that makes people just stop dead in their feet to know that we mean business, that this has to change, and that it's a different day and time? And um, I will have to say that Howard stepped in uh, with that statement of, we've got to be bold. And he really pushed us and said, be bold. And so we collectively came together and said, in order to get this right and immediately get it right, we're going to have to close the stores and bring in training. Mm -hmm. And the only way to do this and to get everybody on one page at the same time is to be very clear about it. So we chose that date and, and went for it. And quite honestly, you know, this happened on April 12th. Um, we, and we had a very short time frame to pull that mm -hmm. together. You know, one of the things that impressed me at, at the time and which showed me that Starbucks was very serious about getting it right in terms of its response was usually when co corporations, companies get in trouble like this, racial mm -hmm. trouble, there are a couple people who are the usual suspects who are called uh, for help. And when I saw that, um, and I believe it was, was Howard Schultz who called Sherilyn Eiffel yes. of the Legal Defense and Educational Fund, uh, Heather McGee, uh, head yes. of Demos, mm -hmm. Common, Yes. And there's one other person, uh, uh, Melody Hobson. Melody Hobson, who's on, who's on the board. Yes. That, to me, showed, told me that these folks are serious, because these are serious, these are serious people. Absolutely. How important, uh, as a leader, how important is it to not just have relationships with the community, mm -hmm. but having knowing real relationships with right. the community. Right. So the individuals you just named are absolutely, um, you know, really good friends and people who understand who Starbucks is because we've had relationships with them for a long time. And it is really important that we all reach out and have ongoing relationships. And these are not, you know, you cannot create a relationship and expect to pick it up in a moment of crisis. 
uh, because it actually it takes too long to reconvene that relationship. The other thing is that Starbucks is a ty the type of company that has a very strong um, social impact position. And so the individuals you just described are people who have been in the mix with us just having day-to-day -day conversations, right? And so it really worked in our favor, um, I would say, because we also, at that time, we had nothing short of probably over 500 firms reaching out to us to do diversity and inclusion training and bias hmm. training. And we totally shut it down because we knew that we wanted to do this differently. The other thing we wanted to do is we wanted to influence other companies. We were very clear about making sure that this was open source because we knew that this was not going, this not only happened at Starbucks, we knew that these things happen other places. You know, this is, this is you know, in, in publicly accommodated facilities, libraries, bookstores, this is what happens. I think about myself personally when, you know, if I want to walk into a high-end department store, I think about this. I'm, I'm that person who has that anxiety when I pull in the parking lot. If I have gone from the gym and then I want to walk into a high-end department store, I still think about that. And I will go home, and the store will be right here, and the gym way over here. I'll go home and change clothes and come back because I know I'm not going to get the service I need. I'm glad you brought this up. There's a great tra transition segue. Um, because a lot of people would like to think that what happened in Philadelphia is an isolated incident. It's, it's just isolated. these two people and it just happened in this store in, in this town. And, um, and you talked about this earlier in that when it, you first got the alert, it hit you in the gut, the gut because it, it was two black men, 23 years old. Your son at the time is 23 years old. Talk about how even though we didn't know who those two men were, we weren't in the Philadelphia store. We didn't see what happened or know what happened. But intuitively, we knew the danger that these two men possibly could have put, put them, could have been in. Yes. And um, I personally felt responsible for that because I, if anything happened to those gentlemen while they were detained, um, personally, me, forget company image, me personally, I just felt like, what, what could happen? I, I know what happens. I mean, all, everything that was happening and still happening today to African-American males when they are just commonly driving down the street, I immediately knew these two gentlemen were at high risk. And one of them in, in an interview said that when they were arrested and taken to the police station, he was afraid. He wasn't sure yes. whether he was going to go home that night. And for some, they might view that as hyperbolic. To me, when I read that statement, I just sort of nodded my head because I would have felt the same, the same yes. way and you felt the same, felt the same way. Um, the, you've said in speeches before, this, you've been at the gym you wanted to go shopping, but you drove all the way home, changed your clothes, and went back to, to the store. In other speeches, particularly the one at Spelman, uh, you're an, alum, an alumna, you, you're the chairman of the board yes, at I Spelman, am. and in a speech there last year, um, you, you were talking about the women of Spelman, the ones who came before, and the women who are going to graduate. And you, you said, when you're a black woman, you get mistaken a lot as someone who could not have the top job. Sometimes you're mistaken for kitchen help. Sometimes people will assume you're in the wrong place. And all I can think is, no, you're in the wrong place. When I read that, I thought, mm -hmm, yeah, go girl. Um, <laughs> The wrong place, that sunken place, is everywhere, deep inside our culture. If there's a place where bias doesn't exist, I haven't found it. There's another part of, of this, this story that you sort of allude to, but I wonder if you'd be willing to talk about it now. And it's something has to do with the CEO, CEO roundtable. Oh, yes. <laughs> OK. Yes, so um, I was invited, when I was named CEO of Sam's Club, um, I was invited to a very exclusive event in New York. And it was um, definitely inv personal invitation only. And uh, we, uh, it's a, it, 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 we were gathering for the event to start in the social area. And so one of the other uh, gentlemen that was there, um, I introduced myself. And so everyone's there because you're only a CEO if, you can, if you're invited to this meeting. Only, only. Um, there's only 24 of us. And so um, I just said, Ros Brewer, Sam's Club. And he said, John Doe. 
B company. And so then he said, well, what do you do for Sam's? And I said, well, wow, that's interesting. So then he said, oh, okay, you must do merchandising. I said, my organization, yeah, we, we're merchants, right? He was like, oh, but maybe marketing. So he just kept going down the line. And then after a while, I was just like, okay, see ya. I mean, I just had to walk away because I, at that point I'm, I'm boiling. And so then I just walked away from him. And so we walked into the room and um, it was a very narrow table. And I actually happened to be the keynote speaker. <laughs> and so when they read my bio, and, I'm, and he was seated next to me, they read my bio. I mean, he was just like, Whoa. and I, for a second, I kind of felt bad for him. But for the other part of me, I was like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so, um, you know. I just couldn't, to me, I was like, wow, I finally get the invitation. You know, I'm you know, very proud of the work I had done with Walmart. And, you know, how could this happen to me? Mm -hmm. I just could, didn't, even, didn't even understand it. And I didn't even have my workout clothes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, can we talk more about this? Because I'm glad you, yeah. told, you told this story. Because, you know, I've been in this situation where, you know, someone gives you the up-down. Yes. And yes. it's that, what are you doing here? Yes. Look. Mm -hmm. And you feel so robbed yes. of, of your dignity. And, and depending on the, where you are, you, sometimes your humanity. And it's always, it's always fun when you know inside he's about to find out yes. who I am. Yes. But those opportunities are few and far between. Yeah. And so how do you, for other people in the audience um, who might be looking at this later, how do you counsel someone to deal with that? Because there's only so long or so often you can push down the impulse to let a few four letter words out. Right, yes, yes, it's very hard. And Jonathan, it's even harder for me because I don't like to talk about myself. Mm -hmm. I'm not the person that will say, you know, like that Ross Brewer Sam's Club, that kind of, I kind of had to work on that one on the elevator myself, you know, um, coming to the event, because I don't do that. So for me, it's harder. But now what I've learned is to, um, you know, always, I, I, I do have to fight on the four letter word. I fight really hard. But what I do is I try to bring a conversation first. And sometimes when I start talking and getting into a conversation, something that's uncustomary, because the first thing will click is, well, how does she know that? Well, you know, well, how does that happen? I mean, you know, I will tell you too, I mean, I, um, I, I'm in this area a lot. My family and I visit here a lot. And, um, and when I tell people, you know, I'm going to Aspen. Well, why are you going to Aspen? Well, because that's where my family and I vacation. And so then they start thinking, okay, but there again, I'm having to like peel off one of my, you know, labels and hand it to someone. Whereas I, I am still waiting for the moment where you walk in the room and we are, and it's more of a meritocracy and it either doesn't matter or you say, I'm just so interested in that person. Can we have a conversation? And so I'm just trying to change the conversation. And when I mentor young women, I always tell them to just be prideful. It is about eye contact, too, and a little bit about your stature and the way you walk into the room, and then engaging the conversation. And so um, it is still something that I'll tell you I work on personally. I try to mentor young women um, through it, but young women even. Caucasian women and African American women, mm -hmm. because I, it's not going away fast enough for me. And so, in the situation um, in Philadelphia last April, or April of 2018, um, there are lots of leadership, leadership moments, but also leadership lessons yes. um, that were learned. What were some of the lessons that you learned as a result of what happened? Yeah. Well, one of the lessons I learned is to. Um, always uh, create deep relationships around you because you never know who you're going to need. Um, I spend a lot of time, at least two or three times a year, I'll go to the Hill and just you know, meet with any congressperson that I can and have a conversation. But I will first find out, I just did this two weeks ago, and I'll just find out what they're thinking about and try and help them because they need us. You know, any resolution is gonna come between the public and private sector. So I try to reach out and help first. And then the relationship starts. So I learn first, maintain the best relationships you possibly can. Second is take ownership because I knew when this happened, um, it, was, it was our fault, 
it was not those two gentlemen's fault. We were not going to make it their fault. We were not going to make it the fault of the local police officers, nor the mayor or anyone else. Starbucks made that issue happen. Our store manager caused it. So own it. When you mess up, own it. And then the third thing I learned is to um, teach and learn. Because uh, there are companies, I mean, I think you all just saw that Sephora closed their stores within the last 10 days or so to do some of the same work. And I think our open source, the work that we're doing right now to train and develop, we have other companies. And whenever I meet other CEOs, I always ask them, so what are you doing on diversity and inclusion? Have you seen our work? And blah, 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 blah. blah. And I just keep going at it. And um, we have some great partners now who want to learn from Starbucks. So uh, teach and learn everywhere you go. So when you talk to your son, and I'm sure you did during, during this, this whole time. Um, what did he say to you? Yeah. So he called me um, right away. And this is the one where I was just like, ah, oh, it made me almost tearful. He was like, Mom, you know, I don't know where you are or what you're doing, but you got to fix this. You, you, you got to get this under control. This is, this, he, was, he was livid. He was livid. And my son's a bit of an activist, um, you know, you get him going. Um, but he, you know, he really wanted me to get after it. But it gave me confidence to do everything I could possibly do because I, I could tell in his voice, I, I heard the fear in his voice. He was scared. He thought about himself. Can I, before I go to uh, Q&A, and I think we're gonna, we're, we will have roving mics. Um, and just to tell you, raise your hand, I'll call on you, and then wait for the mic because we are recording this. When did you have the talk with your son, the talk about how to protect himself yes. when he leaves home? Mm -hmm. So um, my son was raised in Atlanta, and I knew that he wanted to eventually live in, in the Northeast. We <clears throat> had quite a few conversations throughout John's life. And actually, we tried to, we always exposed John to the worst and the best of the world. And through travel, through any opportunity or incident, we always got John close to it. Um, and, uh, but I do recall, it was around when he was 16 years old, and he had his first car, and uh, access to, had his license and access to an automobile. And our biggest worry was him getting pulled over. And so we had that conversation about, listen, you cannot, there's some things that you just cannot do, right? And you cannot have, you know, we had the whole alcohol conversation. But if, when you get pulled over by an officer, you call us right away. And then you also call some friends of the police that we have introduced you to. And you be ready to take action. And so we've, we've been very clear with John about that. And, you know, I think it's given him cons confidence. You know, he lives in downtown Brooklyn, and he just kind of flows right now. So he's confident about it. But we had that conversation with him, and uh, we still have it to this day. So we're going to open up to Q&A. And, wow, there are a lot of hands. The young man here in the orange. Wait for the, sir, wait for the mic. Okay. And also, please Good. make sure that your questions are short. So we can get Thank you very much. There's another aspect to the story that I'd like to hear your reaction sure. to. Eight police officers come in when two people are theoretically arrested without arms, without guns, without any violence. What does that say about the Philadelphia Police Department, and how did you address that part of the problem? Sure. Thank you. So, very good question. Um, I can't speak on behalf of the Philadelphia Police Department, but we have had, um, since this incident, and actually during the time of this incident unraveling, um, we improved our relationship with uh, Noble, which is the black law enforcement um, across the United States, to do some training in, in, um, in concert with them. Um, because we do think that it's a partnership and that some things need to improve. And um, right away, um, we knew that um, maybe the partnership was broken between um, public retail facilities and local law enforcement. And so we have had some ongoing training and development with them across the United States. Question here. Thank you both for being here in this conversation. Um, what do you think is the biggest misunderstanding that people have about minorities? Thanks. That's a very good question. Um, I think the misunderstanding is it's, it's what they don't know. I think they don't understand our heritage and our culture. And I don't think they understand that there is diversity within our culture um, as African Americans. 
And I still think that there is, again, back to my teaching and training, I still think that they don't recognize um, that in most instances, we're really no different, right? When you get down into the deep conversations, our values are the same. And I would love for more people to have value-based conversations. So then, you know, and, and we're not ever gonna be colorblind, physically blind, that's never going to happen. And if it does, that's a bad thing too. We need to appreciate the differences in, in ourselves. So I just think it's a matter of people just marrying their values together, more so than looking at the exterior, because we're more alike than we are different. Question right there in the black, please. No, no, right. Yeah, she's there right there. She's got, she's got it. it. Um, Ms. Brewer, my name is Farah Pandith. Mm -hmm. I'm the former special representative to Muslim communities at the Department of State. I've been out of government for a while. Uh, I want to thank you for your comments. I thought they were excellent and really gets to the heart of something that we have been watching unfold in the last 20 years in a very different way. My question to you around the rising of us versus them ideologies, certainly it's happening in the black community. It's happening in many other communities here in America. We have been lazy on hate. If we wait for the US government or any other government in the world to begin programs to actually deploy a different strategy around history, mm -hmm. around understanding we'll be waiting a long, long time. So here's my question for you. You talked about the CEO roundtable. Have they done anything in the time since you were the keynote speaker mm -hmm. to move American companies to a place where, in fact, they are talking about this issue of hate and us versus them? Thanks. Yes, so this particular roundtable um, has addressed that. Um, a lot of the work that they were doing is around tech, and so they're having the conversation now around minorities and technology. And I think the most interesting thing is, I don't know if this is in exactly true, but I think I was one of the first women and first African American to be in that setting, and since then, there are more. So I see them changing and bringing more people into the conversation, and that's where I think it'll all change. Right. Question here. Thank you. Um, Jonathan, you did such a great job moderating. And Ms. Brewer, I just want to say thank you for your contributions and your sacrifice, because as a black woman in corporate America, you have been a pillar. You've been a role model. To be one of, I don't think people understand what it's like to be the only one. And um, I can do the work that I do because of you. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I have you ex expand on that? because? Um, and I feel the, the emotion from you, especially this, this um, it's not even a notion, it's the reality of being the only one. Mm -hmm. And I remember being a young person a long time ago and walking into a room and just sort of looking around and saying, I'm the only one. Yes. And now here I am on the verge of 52 and still being in rooms where I'm like, I'm the only one. Mm -hmm. But now I'm more co conscious, and it's now not just I'm the only African American, or I could be one of two, but now I'm the only African American man. Mm -hmm. Knowing full well that I'm not the only one, you're not the only one. Correct. Can you talk more about, about that? What that means to you and what that does to you mm -hmm. to almost always be the only one. Right, well, it absolutely does not feel good. Um, and I will tell you that it's, um, it's actually quite lonely because every now and then you wanna catch an eye or you know, have that conversation with that other person that you know you shared something similar to, similar um, in life with. So you know, it's, um, one thing I try to do is when I see young women um, in the audience or if I'm in a business discussion, I see that they are stuck trying to get their message out. They don't feel valued enough because they don't see enough of them in the room, so they feel like, well, maybe my opinion doesn't matter, so I'm not gonna say anything. I will so deliberately call you out and make <laughs> you ask a question mm -hmm. that I have made so many people so uncomfortable, but then they have to start hearing themselves speak and see that people will eventually value you. And so I am trying to bring people in. Um, my life at Walmart, I am so grateful for that experience because I was able to create a leadership team that was 50% minority. And it was the most fabulous working environment ever. And so now that I'm in a position to make decisions and select teams, I get after it. And I'm very deliberate about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please stand up so she can see you. 
First of all, thank you so much. Um, there was a recent incident in Boston, which is where yes. I'm from, at the Museum of Fine Arts. Yes. And I'm struck by um, sort of a very quick knee-jerk response that you get from institutions, organizations, and companies. And it's this response, this is not who we are. And automatically, I'm like, but it, it is, because it happened. Right. Mm. So, and so I wonder, like, how, how do you get underneath the untruth of that? Yes. That's a great question. That's a very good question, because we actually initially said, you know, for Starbucks and coffee, for everything we've done, how could this happen? But immediately, once we, you know, just two seconds into the details, our policies have failed us. Our policies were not front-footed in addressing what happens outside our stores and actually who comes in our stores. Our leaders, the woman who ran that store was a very young, new leader, and she was at Spruce in 18th, and she's from Lima, Ohio. Wrong move on Starbucks, right? And so we do have to stop saying, how could this happen to us? Because it is, we created that situation. It was perfect for it to happen. And that's why we got after it, because it could actually have happened 10 minutes later, because our policies had not been addressed and you know, looked at everything that's happening in the world and say, you can't have a policy that says, you know, you have a bathroom policy. What are you gonna do about your bathroom policy? What, how are you gonna, ha how does that work? And so you're right, we have to take ownership and start saying it absolutely is us. We created a perfect storm in our buildings. Uh, Ernest, before I come to you, the question here, please stand up, uh, miss. Yeah, you in the scarf, yes. Okay, there's the, okay. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, my question is, what is Starbucks doing on an ongoing basis? I mean, training has to happen. It has to be part yes. of the culture to make a difference, right? Thank you for asking that question because uh, our work has been uh, really, uh, a great amount of work has been done. So the closing on May 29, um, and I hope you all go out and look at it and use it in your companies. But May 29 happened, and then every month since then, we've had what's called pour over sessions. And these sessions have been, and they're self-facilitated within our stores. And our partners get a chance to listen to conversations around like mindful decision making. How do you positively encourage someone to come into your store as well as when you might have to break up an occurrence in your store? So different kinds of training. So that's been going on on a monthly basis. But we're just introducing a new series um, that we have gathered with Arizona State University. And it is a um, ongoing uh, process of bias training for both leaders, for people, for baristas, for our supplier partners, and we're just introducing that now. And that's happening throughout the entire company. So it's pretty exciting, some of the work that we've been doing. Great. Ernest, stand, stand, stand up, Ernest, so they can get the mic to you. Hello, um, I'm Ernest Esparza, Aspen Kip uh, Fellow. And my question is, as many of us scholars are navigating new spaces, we are trying to work on our personal brands. And yes. I know for myself, I'm having a struggle with coming up with three adjectives that I want people to look at me as, mm -hmm. um, as someone so public. How do you work on your personal brand and what do you do purposefully for people to see those certain adjectives that you see in yourself? Right. That's a great question. That's a really good question, and I love that you're doing that um, because it gives you, again, this is when you walk in the room and you're the only one. How are you going to describe yourself? And I love that. Um, I, one of the things that I do is um, I want to be a lifelong learner and learn new things, and I want people to see that, that I'm interested in different spaces and different um, things that are even outside of retail and coffee. So, you know, I encourage you to be a lifelong learner and learn other things that have nothing to do with what you do for a living. Um, I'd also tell you is, you know, reach out. You know, um, when you said that statement to me, you would be one that I would love to have a conversation with and, um, and help you work through that. So let's exchange some numbers before we leave. And then the, the last thing that I would tell you. Oh, he, he's great on follow through. <laughs> oh, is he? Well, fantastic, we'll do that. And then the last thing I would tell you to do is, um, you know, definitely uh, reach out and, and pick, and, and set your eyes on that human that you want to be, right? Because when all of these things happen to you, you've got to have a core that you come back to. So when you think about those adjectives, think about the human that you want to be and try and live that out. 
and be very authentic about it and make sure it's something that hits at your core, that you know you can wake up in the morning, you can go to bed with that on your mind every day and you feel good. So think about the human. Where's that hand? Ma'am, stand up. Yep, so they can find you with the mic. It's coming this way on your other side. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sonia Francis from Goodwill Industries International. And I have a question that I've always wanted to know. Years ago, Starbucks had started a hashtag and invited people to have conversations about race relations. Mm -hmm. And people laughed at Starbucks. Yeah. Um, I think you guys were ahead of the time. Yeah. But um, that, that went away. People said that, who is Starbucks to um, talk to me about race relations? There's no issue with race relations in the United States. And fast forward, <laughs> we're under a new <laughs> administration, <you> <laughs> and exactly. it's coming up again, right. and that incident happened. Um, has there been any thought about revisiting that campaign that you had years ago? Yes, so I would have to agree with you that Starbucks was ahead of its time in that because it would be uh, perfect timing right now, you know, with everything that's happening in the world. Um, I think it's showing up in different ways. A lot of the work that we started with Race Matters is actually being filtered through the training and development that we're doing right now. So we never really let it go inside the company. Um, it is uh, part of our, our culture, part of our DNA, but it is coming out in the training and diversity work that we're doing right now. Um, yes, blue shirt. Yes, stand. Wait for the wait for the mic. There and if is. anyone over here has a question, back here, um, raise your hand so I can see you. Go ahead. Um, talk a little bit about how Starbucks is creating a culture of allyship uh, to bring people who look like me into the work. Yes, absolutely. So when we think so allyship. So when we think about our baristas. We actually hire people who have an affinity to interact with other folks, right? And that encompasses all of us. And so when you think about allyship and um, when you think about white males and what they do, when you start at Starbucks, you start off as a barista, and that barista has to be someone that can hand off a cup of coffee and make that person feel like this is the best cup of coffee and the best interaction. It's usually starting their day off. And so we look at you know, our allyship. It is not just one uh, denomination or one kind of person that we're looking at. We do um, reach out to all other communities. One of the things that I would tell you that uh, Starbucks does a fantastic job with as well is the gay and lesbian community, as well as those with um, a unique um, opportunities. And so we just uh, recently opened our first store for uh, the deaf. And so it is a full sign store. And so we're touching every aspect and uh, white males are part of the work that we do. Question here, uh, please stand up so they can find you. Uh, just hearing you talk, I think of um, the Toni Morrison quote that the function of racism is to distract you from actually doing your work as you justify your, yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd love to know how you've kept yourself grounded and doing the work throughout all your years of work. Right. So um, I think it's important for all of us to realize is that in order to do good work, um, inclusion and diversity has to be a part of it. So when I joined Starbucks, um, Starbucks was probably um, experiencing some of its lowest performance. And so when I joined the company, I knew I was gonna be part of a transformation to turn around the company's uh, operating performance. And so if you've been watching Starbucks lately, um, we're, we're achieving good success right now um, while we are uplifting the work on inclusion and diversity, and the two are being done in parallel. And I think if, if I personally had isolated that, I actually think the business performance would not have come forward at the same time, because we're having deeply ingrained conversations about ways of working. We're having conversations about what our future leaders need to look like, what they need to embrace. We're having conversations about what it takes to win. And that includes people and humans. And so the two are in parallel. And when you separate the two, I think um, neither are successful. I keep saying there's a yes question right here. Please stand up so she can, great. Thank you. Um, I am, uh, my name is Starsky Wilson, and I'm with a foundation in St. Louis. I wanted to uh, ask a little bit about leadership formation. Um, sure. I'm a fellow HBCU undergrad. 
Um, you went to Spelman. Yes. One of the things that we learned at Xavier was about kind of uh, code switching, formation and leadership within a context uh, that may be different from us. Uh, as we move toward the reckoning of uh, people of color being people of the American majority and people of the global majority as we are now, mm -hmm. uh, what might leadership formation look like for people who understand them to be themselves to be the majority, uh, but they're not uh, and won't be soon? Uh, so but it, what does it look like for white folks to prepare for leadership and engagement in an inclusive society? And where might they find spaces like HBCUs or spaces like uh, for us right. to prepare for that kind of leadership? Mm -hmm. So um, addressing the, the topic of the browning of America um, and what that means in leadership in corporate environments, I think um, one, as a, an African-American male, I think it's gonna be really important for you to bring your whole self to work because there's going to need to be a learning um, that comes along with this so that people can learn how to partner with people who are different than them. But the one thing that holds people apart from partnering is what they don't know about each other and, and the ignorance between the two. And it's ignorance on both sides, right? And so having gone to an HBCU, um, which everyone knows I love my alma mater, I think it's very important to also, what are you gonna do to complement that, right? Don't lose that HBCU, don't lose yourself, but you're gonna have to complement that with something so that you can see it both ways. Because you're probably, your generation, looking at, your age, you're gonna be the one that's gonna drive this change. And so you need to be thinking about how are you gonna do that? And I think that is the partnerships. How do you bridge across different lines of people who are different than you? And you should, you should require that to come from you and do not expect it to come from anyone else. It has to start with yourself and then everything else will move into place. I think we have time for one more question. Your hand is up. Uh, the, the other side. Thank you for speaking today, Daniel White. My question is, you know, you're, you're on the Lockheed Martin board, yes. and now you're on Amazon as well as the only blackface there. So what is the leadership like when you're the CEO and the COO and now holding those same folks accountable on the board, and how does it change, or how does it differ? Yes, uh, good conversation around that. So I just recently joined the Amazon board, and it's, um, it's been really exciting. Um, one thing I will tell you is that um, I am very grateful to um, be able to bring some best practices to bear and to be in an environment where people are asking me to engage, you know, wanting to learn. But by no means am I um, a token or being brought on for that exact reason. Um, when I was at Sam's Club, I, I led the digital technology work for Sam's Club. So I'm having those conversations with Amazon, but at the same time, um, I am having conversations about what does next generation leadership look like for Amazon, and we're engaging in some really strong conversations around that. I'm actually glad to be there. Timing is everything, you know, and so uh, being in Seattle now and being part of that company, um, it's fun to learn, but it's also fun to influence. Um, and I'm going to take moderator's prerogative and ask the last question. <laughs> um, and you may have, and I'm sure you've touched on, on this and through various answers. Sure. But especially for the young people who are here in the audience, nobody's perfect. Right. But if you were asked, well, not if you were asked, because I'm going to ask you. Um, <laughs> what are the three traits that make a perfect leader, or as mm. close to perfect as possible? Mm. If you could build one. If I could build my own leader. Let's see. So first of all, I would have to say um, high integrity. And I say integrity because you're gonna get challenged and things are gonna be put in front of you and it'll be all about the decisions you make. So uh, best leader would be high integrity. Uh, second is I truly believe in being a selfless servant leader. I feel like I am in this role as a leader to serve the people who work on my team. And so I try to turn it around. So I look for leaders who know that they're not leading just themselves to get ahead. They've got a lot of people that their decisions are going to impact. So selfless servant leaders. And I think the third thing that I would look for, since this is a final, let me think about this one, is authenticity. And so knowing themselves better than anyone else and being willing to live that out um, 
under all kinds of circumstances and never letting that be damaged or impacted. Ross Brewer, COO of Starbucks, thank you very much. Thank you so much.